First of all, we'd like to say thank you. We're blessed and honored that you've chosen to be with us today here at First Southern. We're centrally located in the heart of the River Valley, just minutes from Greenwood and Fort Smith, between Barling and Lavaca, one mile east from the Fort Chappie entrance. We're a biblically-based family. We're made up of ordinary people who serve an extraordinary God. We're comprised of a variety of folks with all kinds of different backgrounds, but we have one heart and one goal, and that's to experience authentic, spirit-led worship. So our focus is exactly what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22, is to love God and to love people. Our worship times begin every Sunday morning at 930, followed by our life groups for all ages, where we look at the truths of God's Word in our lives. If you'd like more information, you can look us up on the web at firstsbc.com or on social media at firstsbc. You might be new to the area, you might be looking for a, a place for your family, purpose, whatever it may be, we would love to experience our time with you here at First Southern. Uh, for that evening. Um, I can't tell you what it is, uh, but it's probably going to be the best uh, entertainment show that you've probably ever seen in your lifetime. That uh, The fact that it's a, a free showing is something that uh, you're going to thank me for for the rest of your life, and the fact that I'm building it up this much should tell you how good it is. So there you go. So you should come to the Valentine's banquet for that. Let's go to the, the Lord in uh, Scripture real fast as we get ready to prepare our hearts for worship. Russ is going to be talking about the next generation and what that is going to look like in the days to come. But I want to read to you out of Psalm 78, uh, chapter uh, 78, verses 5 through 7 real fast as we get ready to worship him. This is what the psalmist writes. He says, He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn. Then arise and tell to their children, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Father, we are so thankful we can gather as a congregation, as a family, with multiple families right now sitting among us. Father, there are so many different situations going on. Those that are hurting, those that are rejoicing, those that are thankful. But in all these different circumstances, Father, we can come to your throne to honor and worship you who have given us all these things. And that together as a family, as a body of believers, that we encourage one another, we lift one another up. We are a family today, Lord. We ask all these things in your holy name. Amen. Amen. We're so glad to have you in our worship time today. If you would, let's stand and let's welcome each other this morning. God bless you. Good to see you here at First Southern.
say amen this morning. Amen. God bless you. Be seated. Pastor. Amen. Thank you, Lee. Isn't it great to be in the Lord's house with his people today? Amen. Amen. We, uh, we have been looking at, over the past three weeks, at the beginning of the year, we started a, a little six-week series, so to speak, uh, looking at issues, major issues that uh, not only face our country, uh, they will face the church and they face our personal lives as well. And so we began to look at them very specifically, intently, and we're going to see, as we have seen, that these are not social issues, these are biblical issues. We talked about the sin of racism. It's a heart problem. We even looked at what the Bible says and gives about immigration and the biblical way to address that. It's the only way in which it will work effectively. We talked about how Israel, the proper historical promise and perspective which we see comes from the word of God. He said in Genesis chapter 12, those who will bless you, I will bless. Those who will curse you, I will curse. And we have seen that specifically today. We're going to look at another issue before us today that we see in the world and in our church and in our lives as well. Where will our hope come from in the generations to come? Each generation except for one, has been given a name. They've been named specifically intently. Their, their time uh, from which they were born, you think about the characteristics uh, in which they demonstrate, and they kind of put that as a whole. They, they look at their values, their beliefs, and their tendencies, etc., and, and, and they come up with specific names. And today is kind of a hot issue once again with the next generation. I'm not talking about one specifically, but a couple, but we will look at what the Bible refers to as investing in those to come. How we will do that as a church and as a generation when we look at who the millennials are. Now, before I say that word, you're going to think this is only for those who are born between 1981 and 1996. And if that's what you think, that's not what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to look at some things specifically, some uh, some. Some, when we look at uh, their values and beliefs, but we're going to be looking at the biblical mandate, which we see from Scripture, the importance in investing in others. Take your Bible with me today. Look with me in the New Testament to the book of 1 Timothy. Hit to your right. You're going to hit the epistles and keep going. You're going to hit First and Second Thessalonians, or we're going to look in 1 Timothy today. We're going to look at chapter 4. As you turn there, uh, this passage that we're going to look at today, matter of fact, this verse that we will see is one that you're probably very familiar with. Uh, one of the words that we've been saying over and over and over for the last few weeks is the word context, context, context. And we talk about the importance of what that means. This passage today, you've heard many times probably, but not in context, context, context. In principle, which is a good thing, but not in the aspect of what's written here. Look with me today in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. Paul writes to Timothy, he says, Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Father, today as we look at your word, Lord, one small, simple voice, one verse, but they have great impact within our hearts and our lives, and yet in the days to come as well. Lord, our intention and our purpose for the church today is nothing compared to yours. So we lay aside our thoughts, our mindset, even our ideas, and we ask today, Father, that your kingdom would come and that your will would be done, and that you would be glorified. And we ask it in your name. Amen. When we look at the scripture as a whole, uh, we begin to see in the Old Testament, the New Testament alike, we see the importance of what it means to set the example. And we see that all throughout the scriptures. We see it in, in so many different areas and so many different ways of what it means that we set the example in the Old Testament, you can probably think of so many examples that we have when God called out his people like we saw last week in Israel. He set them out as an example to be for the nations. When we continue to look, when we look in the New Testament, uh, God says as his people, as his children, as his church, we are to set or be an example. 
It says in 1 Corinthians, it says that we are to be imitators in 1 Corinthians. In the, in the book of Philippians, it says we are to set an example, to be an example. In 1 Thessalonians, it says we are to be proved people, men and women of the faith. In the book of Titus, it says we are to set the example as models of good work. In 1 Timothy, it says we are to be living servants. In the book of Romans, it says we as believers are to live peaceably. And in Hebrews, it says we are to be those who imitate the faith. And in 1 John, it says we are to love one another as God has loved us. And we see the importance of the example given through the scriptures. Now, these are all given... When the understanding and every single one of these uh, points of emphasis, we are to be investing in the generations to come. As believers, as, as the church and as leaders, we are to be investing in the generations to come. And so as Paul writes to his beloved friend and his disciple Timothy, he, he says some words here that sometimes people get misconstrued uh, of understanding what takes place here. He says, let no one look down or despise your youth. I think about this passage. I've heard it used so, so many times, used out of context, but with the right principle or mindset, uh, what we see from this passage. Now, let me tell you what it does not mean right quick before we look at the application for us today. This does not mean what we think it means right now. It does not mean uh, for us to say the youth, and we try to put that in context of what we identify as youth. What did that mean when Paul wrote that to Timothy at this time? Context is, is important. If you lived in that culture, that Greek culture, whatever culture you were that particular time, they had an understanding of what it meant to be a young man or those who were older in age. We refer, we refer to that terminology of, uh, we say, hey, when, when, when a man considered him to come of, of age, so to speak. And at that particular time, in that culture, uh, that came when you came of age. Usually it was after the age of, of 30, 30-ish, that when a man was considered of age, uh, 30, pretty interesting, that's when Jesus began his ministry. Most cultures at that particular time had that mindset, and that's important. Uh, because that's what he's referring to in this passage. He's thinking about, hey, here's this man, Timothy. And I know that he's not a young man is what we would think. We're going to see that. But so he refers to something specifically about that. Now, when we think about that today, those coming of age, you have to earn that respect. You have to earn that credibility. And that will be seen in how you've demonstrated that throughout your life to that point of time. So usually they say up to that age. Up to that age, the age of, of 30, you, you've put the things, the right things in practice in your life, and you'll be able to share that with others as well. So understand what Paul's not saying here. He's not saying to Timothy, you are a teenager. You're not a teenager. Oftentimes, I've heard youth pastors, we laugh about Daniel, they'll, they'll stand up. I've been as a youth pastor myself, and you'll be at camp, and they'll say, now look, this, is, this was written specifically for you. Well, the principle's written in truth, but this is the wrong context and understanding because Timothy was definitely not a teenager. The first time that we see him referenced in his relationship with Timothy was when Timothy was 15 years previous, when Timothy was in his 20s on his second missionary journey. And so when he refers to this, this is some 15 years later. So if Timothy's in his 20s when that took place, this is 15 years later, we know he's at least 35. He's, he's, he's probably pushing 40. He's almost over the hill, y'all. He's, he's pushing 40 in there, all right? And so he knew what he was saying when he said, let no one despise your youth. You have to understand the context and, 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 the, and the society of that particular time. The other day, this past uh, Wednesday night, or it might have been two Wednesday nights ago. I, I can't remember, but uh, uh, we, we, no, it was two weeks ago. And uh, we had one of our church members come up, and I began to address it. And I don't want to say who it is so that you guys don't put... Don Owen, think of him in a bad light. But anyways, Wednesday night, Don Geneva showed up, and, and we were walking up, and Leo was to my side over there. And when Don walked up, I said, hey, boy, how you doing? And that's all I said and smiled. And he looked at me, and he said, how big are the men where you grew up? <laughs> See, some of you already know. And some of you are like me. You go, I don't understand. And so I looked at him, and I said, what? He said, how big are the men where you grew up? And I looked over at Leo. I said, Leo, I have no idea what he's talking about. Leo said, you called him a boy. I said, what's up, my man? 
Had a good laugh right there. I learned something, amen? Uh, un understanding context of what was given, what's said in this particular passage. And so when he refers to him as a, don't let him despise your youth. He's not saying, Timothy, you're a teenager. You're even in your 20s. You're a grown man, and he understands that. And so what we see without question, he's going to refer to him in, in the importance of his investing, his investing in those who are around him. So we see this truth is so important for us. We know the importance of what Paul says to Timothy. Don't let anybody look down on your youth. But he gives them a very specific purpose, doesn't he, what he says. But set the example in speech and conduct, love, faith, and purity. The importance of investing, discipling those who are younger in the faith. Now, that's the truth we get as well. He says to Timothy, what I have done for you, with you, and over you, you are doing and continue to do in those who are younger in the faith, investing. Uh, out in the hallway, uh, Daniel said, do I need to announce this Hopship University? I said, no, because it goes along with the message today, so I have it. And out in that hallway, you're going to see uh, some, some, some classes, some options that are given out there. It's very specific and intentional. Uh, years ago, this is something the Lord laid upon my heart uh, for us here at First Southern. I don't, I don't look at what other churches do or why they do it. That's, that's their business. This is us here at First Southern. And said, you know, we preach the word. We preach and we come, we worship together, have corporate worship on Sunday morning. We break down. We have our life group time, which is extremely important for you to be able to connect in the faith with those who are around you, does not matter your age, your family situation, connecting with God's people. Uh, that's what we see biblically as well. So we come back on Sunday night because I think one of the glaring issues we have in the church today is a lack of discipleship or investing in the body in the spiritual way which God has called us to do so. I believe the church today is, is the old song, Deep and Wide. And we hear say, we preach and preach and preach, which was great, but we got to put into practice what is preached so often, we take Sunday nights and we set that aside specifically in the springtime for what's called Discipleship University. And so each one of those classes that are out there, whether they're in preschool or our children's or our student ministry or our adults, are discipleship oriented. Every single one of them. Uh, whether it's on prayer and spiritual warfare in your life or spiritual parenting or Discipleship 101 that Kenny's doing. I, I've asked the question before, how many of you have ever had someone personally disciple you within your life? And usually it's less than half of those folks who do that. If you've never had that in your life at any point in time, I would encourage you to take Kenny's class. It's so going to be so important for you. I'll take all the, those who are considered guests here at First Southern, those who are new members. We go through specifically, intentionally, uh, who we are, what we've been created to do, and why that is in a biblical way, and what that means for us as a church. Many of you have gone through that, and I praise God for that. So what we do, we do very intentionally on Sunday nights, Discipleship University. Now, we kick that off next Sunday night. How many of you catch that right quick? It's a great way we Baptists get to incorporate two of God's favorite things, <laughs> food and football. Amen? All right? And so we show up, and we have Super Bowl Sunday, and we kick off Discipleship University and as always, there'll be a spread out there, and you'll be able to snack on things. But more importantly, you're going to have the opportunity. You'll be able to meet with Lee one-on-one -on -one or with Daniel. Uh, it might be uh, with uh, Dean and Financial Peace. You've had questions about that, what's involved with that. Uh, you say, well, I, I don't have financial problems. Well, good for you. You're one of a few, all right? But we look at the biblical perspective, what's given in Scripture, whatever it is, you can talk with us face-to-face, -face, and we're going to be able to talk about that on Sunday night, next Sunday. And then we begin our classes the following week, and we begin them all here. We all meet at 6. Dean, I think, once again, you're going to, are you starting at 530? That's kind of what you do as well, because financial peace is a little bit longer, all right? So we do that corporately on Sunday nights. Let me tell you what discipleship is not. Discipleship is not just about face time. It's not just about class time. That's not what, just what discipleship is about. It's equally important that we give opportunity time for people in ministry as well. Discipleship is not where I sit down and you sit down and across a desk or a table, whatever it may be, and I began to tell you all these things. And there should be some great biblical truth with that. It's not necessarily about that class time or that face time, but it's just important in discipleship that we give opportunity for that to be played out in the life of God's people. That's why what you saw this morning was so beautiful today. 
How many of you came in today and usually where someone's standing or greeting, there was a kid there this morning? Sometimes they're there whether they're picked to be there or not. All right, We have designated hugger in, in the church. We have a couple designated kids that run around and they just run around and greet folks all the time. And usually get, and our kids, they're a part of that today. Why? Because that's ministry opportunity. That's discipleship in action. That's what the church is supposed to be like. It's important. Today we're going to do our offering time. We do our offering time on the last Sunday of every month. Our, our kids will be there as well uh, to help out with the offering time. One of our kids will be praying for our offering this morning. Guess what? That's discipleship and ministry opportunity in action. That's what we're supposed to be in the church. That's called investing in the future in the spiritual aspect of the church today. Many will say, many say today, uh, they talk about investing and they think about this and that and aspects and they began to kind of uh, play with the situation of the, the hot topic of the millennials in church today. You say, well, you can't reach this generation effectively. Uh, you, you can't reach them effectively because here's why. Uh, who they are, how they're raised, what they've seen, what they experienced, their mindset, there's no absolutes in their life, which is what they say. There's no moral code in their life, which is what they say. They say there's no value in their life. And I'm going to give you a great theological word you need to write down. I gave you a great Hebrew word. I'm going to give you a great theological word to write down today. That word's this, hogwash. Write that down if you would. <laughs> Sheila, I don't know where you're going to look that up. But anyways, it's It's hogwash. Talk about how you can't do this and how you can't do that and, and reaching folks. I, I can tell you there's two easy ways to do that, to share and show God's love. They say that the millennial generation is an entertainment-based mindset, and we see that. We know that. Matter of fact, what you see happen in churches today all over uh, America, as you see a different format, so to speak, of how the worship service looks. You walk in and it's dark and the walls are dark and the ceiling's dark and there's lights and there's all this stuff going on. Let me tell you something. You want to reach them? I don't care what the atmosphere is like. If you have a loving atmosphere, you're doing the right thing. That's important. That's important. About loving God and loving people. That's so important we see today. And we talk about different atmospheres and, and ways to be able to do that. They say there are no values for them to be able to adhere to in their life. Well, I disagree with that. There's no, without any question. Matter of fact, you hold in your hand the greatest book of value and moral absolutes ever given in, in all of, of history. The word, the living word of God. It changes hearts and lives and souls. So if there is a lack of value or morality, and they say, why? We'll be able to share that with them. And when I say be able to share it with them, listen, share with them in a loving way. Loving way. That, that's the third thing you do. Share truth, God's truth, which is intended to be done in a loving way, in the right way. You know, we come from past generations. We would say this. Well, why do we do that? We do that because that's the way it's always been done. That's the way we're going to do it. And that's what God said. That's enough. You got it? Don't ask that question anymore. Well, that's real loving. God bless you. God bless you. Well, see you later. <laughs> All right? I don't want to be a part of that. To do it in the right way. To be gentle. Because that's exactly what we see in Scripture as well. How often do we see Paul says, I was, I was strong to those who were strong, but I was weak to those who were strong. Weak and understandably so. Why? Because he understood where they were. So be gentle. Be gentle in, in, in how to correct, encourage, and love and build the faith. A great example this week. I, I wear this shirt today with great reason for some of you who don't know. It's the last day of duck season. And so this is my homage to, to my brothers that are out there. And, and so this past Friday, I was, I was off and Daniel was here and, and I heard about a a guy who showed up at, uh, here at the church, and he asked the question. He said, listen, uh, my wife and I were looking for a church, but the first thing I want to know is, do you, do you guys read, use the King James only? And so his mindset already. And so Daniel said, I would love to talk to you about this. He said, matter of fact, I've made a cup of coffee. <laughs> Come on, you like coffee? And the guy's like, well, you know, kind of him hawing around. He didn't get dogmatic about it in any way, shape, or form because people sometimes have a, uh, a mindset or an understanding about something that can be a, a pivotal point. He didn't come across and say this and this and this. He said, come in my office, sit down, let's talk about it. What a great truth. 
What a great truth. That's the way we're to be regardless of age or generation. To be spiritually understanding of where people are. And be able to share truth in a very loving way, a gentle way. Not to be forceful. It's totally different than how many of us have grown up in our life. Mom, Dad, Dad, why is this? Because I said so, that's why. Be, be loving. Another truth when they talk about millennials, I often say the reason you can't reach them is because they don't know what real faith is. It's not been modeled for them in the right way. And there's great truth with that. We're going to talk about that in just a second. To model real faith. Model genuine love in action. Christianity, authentic Christianity as we see in the New Testament. We're going to talk about how to do that. Matter of fact, that's what we're going to see. Build relationships. Be relational. So when he talks about how to build this faith and we can't do this, let me give you five things we're going to see from Scripture today. We're going to see five things that are important from this passage. Exactly what's referred to today we see on a hot issue today. Get ready for these five things. And as you get ready for them, let me tell you something. I'm blessed today. I'm blessed today to talk about speaking about investing and how important that is because that's what we want to do as a church. We invest in our preschoolers and our children and our students. We invest. And today we got a beautiful example of that. It's always a blessing when, when God begins to do a work in, in the church like he has been doing. But when he uses somebody inside the church in maybe a very specific way, one of those folks that we've invested in many and many, many over the years. But today I want to use the example of, of Taylor Hearn. Taylor Hearn, the past year, was I had the opportunity while she was school to go be a children's intern at a, at a local church. And she did that for the summer. And uh, how it affected her heart and her life and where we are currently in our children's position. Obviously, with Will getting to go back home for him and be at First Baptist. What a great blessing for you, for your family, for Will. And so I began to pray over the last several weeks about, Lord, where are you? What are you doing? And how are you doing that? And folks would come and give a name or two, and I would be so appreciative of that. And just in my time of prayer and fasting, one thing came to my heart and mind. And a few weeks ago on a Sunday night, we were talking with our, our parents and about this and that, what we need to do. And Taylor walked up on Sunday night. And she said, Brother Russ, whatever you need, you let me know. And she had this look in her eye when she said that. And I said, I got news for you, kid. I will. I will let you know. And I will let you know soon. All right? Began to pray. And matter of fact, her mom, dad, and, and their conversation, their prayer time as well. So just took that week to kind of see where the Lord was laying upon her heart. And so uh, I, I want to tell you as, as, a, as a vote of, of confidence from you today, Taylor is going to be stepping into our children's ministry position and pouring our heart and life and using adults to, to be with our kids in the days to come. Are you excited about that this morning? Amen. Amen. So tonight at uh, 5.15, uh, I'll be meeting. It says in your bulletin at 5 o'clock. Uh, but obviously uh, today is a, is a tough day for Eddie, for you, for your family. The visitation for Miss Paula's funeral will be this afternoon. Uh, two to... 3.30, I believe, or 4-ish, and so they'll be with the family. I'll be meeting with them afterwards, and as soon as I get done there, I'll be here. So it might be around 5.15. We'll meet in the fellowship hall, all right? So I praise God for the investing that we do and that we're supposed to be doing in the spiritual aspect. Look back at our context of the passage today. It says, set the believers an example in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity. And now this, this command is not just given for one generation for one particular time. It's for all of us, all the time, to set the example. Timothy, you have been set as an example. Now you are setting the example. And that's so important for us. If you want your kids, if you want your family, if you want them to love God and love the church, let them see that love in you. That's so important. One of the things that, that breaks my heart, broke my heart early on in the ministry, I would uh, see ministers and I would think about what was taking place within their life or their family and their, 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 their young men. And I was, you know, 18, 19 at the time and I saw their young sons or daughters and you saw what people would always say is pastor was this way and the kids are this way. But I saw behind the doors oftentimes of what took place, not just with pastors or with leadership, 
Uh, oftentimes they would show up and, uh, and you wonder why the kids don't love church is because oftentimes you get in the car after church and you say, I can't believe he did this or I can't believe they sang that or I can't believe this or I can't believe that or if they just would have done this, if they just would have done that, if they just get that air figured out in there in my part, in my section, if this would have happened, if this would have happened, whatever it may be. Well, did you hear what so-and-so said, whatever it may be? And they sit there and they begin to talk about all the things, the negative things which took place in church. All the meantime, the kids are sitting in the back seat and they're taking everything in. Well, that's the way we grew up. Today they put earplugs in, you know, or, or, or what have you. And hopefully they don't hear it as near as much. But that should never take place. It should never take place. Our thoughts, our opinions, whatever it may be. Let me tell you something. It's the Word of God is what's most important. I, well, if we would have done this or done this better, or whatever it may be, or whatever it, it is, set the example. Let me tell you something. If we sang just the songs you wanted, you'd be the only person here. Think about it. There's lots of songs out there, Lee. Lee, if you, Lee, brother Lee, I got a song I want you to sing. I, I promise you, he has a book this thick of songs. Three volumes. <laughs> Three volumes. That's pretty good, brother. The same thing with the Word of God. We just want to preach the word of God. We want to sing. You, you can always get something out of a message or a worship service. If you're saying, well, it's not my style of music, don't worry about the style. What's the intent of what's being sung? Is it to glorify the Lord? Then praise God in it. If his word is being preached, it's about this. or that. You can always get something from the word of God if you let the word of God get something out of you first. That's so important. So important for us. Set the example. That's what he's saying to Timothy in this passage. And he gives him these five areas of what it means to set the example. He says, first of all, do it in our speech, in our conversation. Our speech, our conversation. Turn over to the book of Matthew right quick. Hold that spot there where you are. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 12. I'm going to start in verse 34. Well, I'll start back in verse 33. You either make the tree good and its fruit good, or you make the tree bad and its fruit's bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Look what he says in verse 34. Where's John Yusko? John Yusko, you know what this verse says right here? Do you remember this? A long time ago. I shared this verse one time. And I said, you broad, you, <laughs> yeah, thanks for laughing. You vipers. <laughs> Look what he says here. How could you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. Whew. Paul says to Timothy, start with your speech, our conversations, because they reveal where our heart is. This past week, I done this Friday, but the Friday before, I had a friend of mine say, hey, uh, you know, one of my guys that I, I'm able to hunt with, he said, hey, I got a friend I want to bring with me. He lives in a different city. And, and I said, uh, sure, that's fine. He said, you don't mind at all? I said, no, that's not a problem. He said, well, we're just, I just want to kind of give you a heads up. He's, he's, he's not like us. And I said, what's like us? He said, well, he's not a, I, I don't know if he's a believer or not. And he's, he's, pretty, uh, he's pretty loose with his words. And I said, well, that's, that's his business. And I said, I understand where you're going. I appreciate the heads up. And so that guy was, uh, knew he was going to be hunting with us. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the person that he's dating this particular time, she said, now listen, you can't talk like you talk around me. That guy is a preacher. And where we go, we call him the preacher. We call him Rev. So you better watch what you say. His words were here. He goes, I am who I am. I'll say whatever I want to say to whoever I want to say it. 
And so when I showed up, uh, one of the things he said, he just said, ah, da, 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 and I'm, he said, I just want to let you know, I, I kind of let some things fly out there. And I said, I just want to tell you one thing right quick, my man. I'm going to answer for my life just like you're going to answer for your life. I said, understand that. He said, okay, I'm cool if you're cool. I said, I'm cool because I know who's in charge, bro. And he just kind of smiled. So we had a week and what have you, and I've been really thinking about that and praying about that with who he was and just asking the Lord for an opportunity, what to say and how to say it, uh, and when that can take place. Well, it turns out a week later, this was just this, this past Friday, uh, he's going to show up again with an, another guy. And this guy, same thing, one of his best friends from growing up. And so I was kind of staying back, and this guy began to talk about his life, and these two were going back and forth. This guy was, uh, his language was absolutely wonderful, talking about his life, and this guy was being pretty colorful at points in time. And he said, this guy over here said, but that was my days before B.C., before Christ. And I said, oh, Lord, thank you for that opportunity. I was sitting back here in the back, and I said, let me ask you a question right quick, my friend. I said, you just said B.C. He goes, yeah. I said, what led to that? And so he would talk about his life when the Lord, literally on a college time, and he was 21, all the things he had done up to the point in time in his life, and uh, the, the remorse and the conviction of his sin. He said, my, my college pastor was praying for me and over me. He said, his name was so, oh, I know him. And this guy got tied back into that conversation. I said, he goes, that guy's a great guy. He said, he is a great guy. And they began to talk about his life. And he says, on this night and this happened, he said, this is the night the Lord drew me to a relationship. I said, praise God. Guess what happened? Man, a total change took place. And I said, you know what? We didn't shoot many ducks because I didn't really care. I saw some life being shared that day. I said, what a great opportunity. Our speech, our conversations give the evidence of our heart. It's so simple, but it's so true. Our speech is a reflection of what's deep within our heart. What we dwell upon, what we think upon, is what we say. That's why it says in Colossians chapter 3 so beautifully, let the word of God dwell in you richly. I got a little phrase for you. Speak richly this week. Speak richly in the lives of others. And that doesn't mean, hey, I think you're going to get $1,000. <laughs> That's not right. There are those who do that. That's wrong. You speak life biblical truth you speak richly to those who are around you because it matters he says not only to timothy our speech but look what he says he says and it's our conduct not just your speech but your conduct paul says make sure your actions match up with your words that that's the that's the theme we see so prevalent in today's time this most ironic i guess i would say so sadly this generation has grown up, and I've shared this before. I, I've heard it so many times at the ballpark and different times. Dad says, you do as I say, not as I do. Or because I said so. Oh, I think it's one of the greatest detriments to our current situation. One of the reasons this current generation is so passionate about what their passion is because they've experienced such hypocrisy both spiritually and ethically as well. That's truth. If someone's in a situation where they are, and we look back on that and say, well, that's their fault, then why did we put them in that situation? Shame on us. That's our fault. Not many amens there. I didn't figure there would be. But maybe today, maybe today, maybe just today, there needs to be some time, some prayers in our hearts and our lives of repentance. Maybe there needs to be some words of forgiveness spoken. And when that takes place, just watch what God will do in the hearts and lives of his people. Matter of fact, it's only what God can do. He said our speech and our conduct. And then look what he says in our love. He says, look at the love. This is something we speak of over and over and over again because it's that important. and needs to be shared over and over again. This love he refers to is a biblical love. It's God's love. It's a selfless love. It's a self-sacrificing love. Because worldly love is just the opposite. It is selfish and self-indulgent. What can I get? 
He says, as a believer, a follower, a knower of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are commanded to walk in love. You know how often we do that? Every Sunday when we show up for church, that's when we walk in love. No, that's not when we walk in love. When do we walk in love? We walk in love daily. That's why it says so beautifully in 1 Corinthians, love is patient and it's kind. You know what? That's all that needs to be said there. Love's patient and it's kind. But look what he says after that. But it does not envy, it does not boast, it's not arrogant or rude. I have to stop right there and say, Wow, Lord, this has been in my heart. This has been in my heart. And this has been in my heart. I've already messed up. He goes on and says, does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It's not rejoice at wrongdoing. But this is what love is. It rejoices with the truth. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Because real love, biblical love, never ends. you got to ask yourself the question there. Am I walking in God's love daily in my life? My words matching up with my life, matching up with God's love. Look what he says, the fourth thing. He says our faith. He talks about the importance of faith. He's not referring to our saving faith. But he's talking about the fullness or the abundance of faith, meaning we have a full assurance and the confidence because of what Christ has done and who he is, he will fulfill what he said he will fulfill. Some people explain it as this. They say it's his full fruitfulness for the freedom of mind and confidence resulting from an understanding of our relationship with Christ. It's never wavering. Our faith is a never wavering faith. When you think about that example, you got to think about those who are at that point in time within their life. And I think Paul writes that specifically because where he referred to as Timothy as an old man or a young man, he refers to himself in Philemon, uh, verse 9, he says, I am an old man. I'm an old man. And he knew where he was in that life as well. This past week, uh, we, many of you know, and, and Eddie in our conversation, our prayers for you, for your sister Pam and your family. That past week, I had the opportunity to go see Miss Paula on Tuesday. And I just sat there and held her hand and talked to her for a little bit. I said, how you doing, Miss Paula? She said, I don't know. I don't know, but I know this, Brother Russ. If the Lord wants to take me home, I'm ready. No failing faith. Look what he says, fifthly. Talks about his purity. Our purity. He's going to be very specific about this. Not just our conduct and our love and in faith, but in purity as well. Our heart and our mind, our lives, when it comes to the area of sexual purity, is what he refers to here. He says to be above reproof, to be above reproach in two very specific ways. Not just in the physical sense, above reproach, but even in your heart and your mind, to be above reproach. We think about the day and the time in which we live and how easy it is to fail in this area, and so many are. They say, well, how how do I win that battle? It's so hard. How do I win that battle? And that's the key. You can't win the battle. The battle's already been won for you. You have to have the right understanding biblically. That's why it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, flee sexual immorality. For every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexual immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Whom you have from God, you are not your own. For you are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. When you have that right understanding, that biblical perspective, that you're not your own, you know that the battle has already been won for you and over you. And walk in that. Amen. So i got to ask you the question today. Who invested in you? Who invested in you? You say, well, nobody invested in me. Someone has invested in you at some point in time. 
the scale would obviously vary greatly within this room. So let me ask the question, so who are you going to invest in? The good news today is this. Every single one of us understands that we've been invested in because of what Christ has done for us. God gave us his all through his son. Amen. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed this morning. I'm just going to ask in the stillness, in the moment this time, as Miss Ray to play so softly, do you just ask the Lord to speak to your heart this morning? There are many today, probably the vast majority, would say, thank you, God, for investing in my life, for the gift of your son, for how you provided in so many ways. And today, in this moment, this time, you just let this be a time of blessed prayer and thankfulness to the Father for what he has done. But also let it be a time where he invests in you to say, who are you investing in the days to come? And maybe, just maybe today, there's someone here that the Lord has spoken to your heart about what it means to have a relationship today. To know him. To not have a religion, but a relationship. That he's given us all today. And right now, as you sit there, you say, God, thank you for speaking to my heart. I thank you for the truth of your word. Today, with all my heart and soul and mind, I ask you to wash me, to cleanse me, to make me new, to be a child of God forevermore. And today, if that's your prayer, it's the greatest day of your life. This is what we call our time of response here at First Southern. There'll be some who will be praying. Some will come forward. Some will stay where they are, whatever it may be. But if today, if that was your prayer, a day of transformation. I'm here, Daniel here. Come and take us by the hand today and say, I just want you to know what God's done in my heart and my life. It's the greatest day of your life, and we want to rejoice with you today. Whatever it is, let's stand together. As we stand, God, may you Lord, be glorified. I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. And without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Our ushers, our little ushers and our big ushers are making their way forward today, all right? So kiddos, you've got a place you've been assigned to, all right? And so you guys are going to go to your spots, all right? Morgan, who are you with, kiddo? You don't know? All right, come here. Come over here. That a girl. 
All right, you got Delaney? All right, everybody's right here? There you go. Go right there. Go right, go right there. Go right there. Out of the way. Hannah, you come over here with me because you're going to pray for our offering this morning, okay? You can hold that. All right, we good, fellas? All right, pray for us. Dear God, please help us when we need it. And for the ones that are poor and don't have any shelters, have shelters. And for the ones that are sad and feel like they've been let down, not be let down. And Lord, thank you for this offering. In Jesus' name I pray. One day you'll make everything new, Jesus. One day you will bind every wound. The former things shall all pass away.
We'll sing and shout the victory. Let's do that chorus again. When we all, let's sing it again. When we be a better song to sing this morning. Amen? Amen. Bless you guys. Funeral will be tomorrow at 10 o'clock right here. All right, visitation at 2. God bless you. You're dismissed to your life groups. Have a great day. Thank you once again, and we were so blessed to have you be a part of the service here at First Southern today. If you have the opportunity and you're in the River Valley, we would love to have you be a part of our corporate worship service. Sundays at 9.30 to 10.30 at 12 West Central in Central City, Arkansas. Bless you and have a wonderful week.